All righty. Let's go get started. All right, so let me start off. Let me get the sign-in sheet passed around. Here's this. Here we go. All right, a couple announcements. So you all got a homework due on Friday. So before I got into things, I want to see y'all have any questions. This is a pretty short one. It, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. The next one's going to be a, a, a little bit longer. So everybody good? No. What? Yeah. Ah. All right. Um, I know this is concrete design, but I did want to mention the steel bridge because the ASC steel bridge team got their steel in on Monday. And if you're interested in doing a little bit of cutting, a little bit of grinding, a little bit of welding, getting your hands dirty and whatnot, uh, I'd contact Austin Page. Uh, he's the, uh, the steel bridge captain. So just uh, page 44 at Marshall. Um, uh, it's a lot of fun. Okay. So um, another thing I am sort of going to harp on this a little bit so everybody doesn't forget. Remember our first uh, celebration of learning is on Wednesday, uh, February 22nd. So everybody is remembering that. Again, I offset it from steel design so you wouldn't have exams on the same day. So uh, hopefully that works out uh, pretty well. Everybody good? All right. So today we're going to continue on with some beam design examples. Today we're, uh, our design example is probably going to be a, a lot simpler than what we did last time. The example that we did last time was one that we had, where we had an unknown cross section. You know, we didn't have a clue what the uh, what the beam looked like. Um, in unknown cross section territory, by and large, there's two variables. There's two unknowns. Okay, one of them is the geometry. We need to know how wide the beam is, how deep the beam is, uh, etc. The second one is the steel. Okay, so we got two variables that are sort of hopping around. Because of that, we had to make some guesses and some, uh, some assumptions. For this, you know, that, that's not the case. When we design a, a beam with a known cross-section, we know what the beam look, looks like. So all we got to do is solve. We just have to solve for the steel. So the design process for a, a, a member with a known cross-section is, is a lot easier. You know? And again, this... Uh, uh, this comes about when we're using something like precast elements, when all of the, the form work is ready-made and it's all uh, 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 predetermined. All we got to do is start selecting some rebar. So this is a very common uh, challenge for people who are designing reinforced concrete elements. Um, our key is we're going to go back to using those rows, those reinforcement ratios. But we're going to be a little different with this. We're not going to use the 0.18 FC prime over FY because that was just a guess. Right? That was when we had no clue what the beam looked like and we had to make a starting guess. It isn't the story here because we can solve for it. Okay? So instead of just guessing a value, we're going to derive one. Now, the, the derivation, it, it's pretty simple. It, it's just a little bit of uh, alphabet soup. But I want to walk back to, to this. So if you recall when we were discussing the economy of reinforced concrete beams and we were talking about how Things like, you know, the more rebar you put into a beam, the stronger it is, but then its failure mechanism changes. Remember, it goes from a nice gradual yielding to a really sudden crushing. And we uh, graph that by using the, the following expression. Well, this is, a, look at this, this is a pretty powerful expression because this tells us the moment capacity of a reinforced concrete beam as a function of its dimensions, the properties associated with the material, and row, okay? So if we know everything but the reinforcement, all we got to do is solve for row, and that's it. So we do a little bit of uh, rearranging, some uh, multiplying out, and what ends up happening is this starts to look a little bit like a, a quadratic equation. You know, a pile of junk times row squared minus a pile of junk times row plus another pile of junk, you know, a ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. So it's a pretty simple quadratic equation. So just break out the quadratic formula, you know, chug everything out and do all your algebra uh, and whatnot and go through and, and clean it up. And that's what you get. It's simple. Uh, I'm not going to make you all do all the algebra because if, if you got through count three, for goodness sake, you can do algebra. So, um, <laughs> so if you take this quadratic equation and go through and solve for row, I mean, if, if it's a quadratic, you're going to have two answers. Well. Only one of them is going to give you a positive row value, which that's the only one we really care about. I mean, you can't, a negative reinforcement ratio doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? 
area of steel over area of concrete. It's got to be positive. So we just take the positive root and there you go. So plug and chug. We can calculate the row that we need for our beam and start selecting steel. And that's it. <laughs> so here's our design procedure. So step one, we got a beam. We're in design mode. We got to compute the factored moments, which remember last time we had to assume the self weight of the beam because again, we didn't have a clue what the beam looked like. Well, now we do, right? We have a clue. We know it's a precast element. We know the dimensions, so no assumption needed there. Really, <coughs> excuse me. Really, the only assumption that we've got to make is phi, our phi value of 0.9. Remember, phi varies as a function of the strain in the steel. And if you don't know what the, the steel is, you obviously don't know what the strain is. So you got to make a guess. So we'll assume that phi value is 0.9. I mean, that's what we'd like to have happen, anyways. And then go on. Calculate a row, take that row, row BD, get an area of steel. And then do the same thing that we did last time. You know, go, go off of our beam design chart, pick a few families of representative reinforcement patterns, and then uh, pick the one that's most economical. Check our uh, ACI requirements, and there you go. That's it. Pretty straightforward, all right? Does anybody have any questions? This is important stuff, so I really want this to, to be clear. Again, we're not using the 0.18 FC prime over FY because we're not in unknown cross-section territory. All right. Any questions? All right. <coughs> okay. So let's, let's take the following uh, beam. Now, I've got this one, and I've simplified it out a little bit. Uh, instead of doing the, the full-blown analysis like we did last time, I'm just going to say, you know what, let's keep it simple. Let's just design for a factored moment of 160 foot kick. So instead of doing the, the WL squared over 8 and going through and doing all that, um, you just said, ah, what the heck, let's just uh, uh, give you the moment. All right, because if you can do it once, you can do it again. All right, so here's the, the beam. Now, let's, let's go through a few parameters. The beam is 16 inches wide, and it's 21 inches effectively deep. You know, it's a D of 21 and an H of 24. <coughs> All right. One thing I do want to point out, it looks like I've got three bars. I'm not trying to say that, oh, we are going to use three bars. I'm just saying that our reinforcement is here, and, and that's where we're going to place it. We might use six bars, we might use five, whatever makes sense. Yes, sir. That's a good question, and, and the answer is yeah. I mean, most of your like precast, ready-made form work is going to be in very even multiples of inches. I mean, you're you know like 14 inches, 16 inches, 18 inches. It, it's going to be uh, uh, tough to find like a 15.25 inch you know ready-made set of forms. Now, before I get to yours, let me also say this: if you're doing something like a like a very custom element in a being or in a building like a like let's say like you've got a transfer girder in, in a um, in, in a building. So if you go to a let's say like a like a big hotel or something like that, and you know you go to the lobby, the lobby extends you know what three or four stories high. Those beams up there that are holding up the the ceiling, well they're probably also holding up a few stories of load above it. And those are called transfer girders, and those girders are sort of they're unique snowflakes. Like you've got to you got to really be careful with those designs. And in that world, yeah, you might use some, you know, 24.5 inch spacing because, I mean, you got to have that precision. But for most, you know, regular beams in a building or a, like the Third Avenue parking garage, those are all predetermined sizes, and that, that is very common. So that sort of answer your question? Okay. Yes, sir. You had one. Are you talking about the beam or the traffic? I'm... Oh, absolutely. Oh. No, that's on us. Uh, I mean, re remember the example that we did last time. Remember we had to guess the self-weight in the beginning, and then we went back and updated it? Well, we were talking about a, a beam in a building, and we got self-weights of, what was it, like 400 pounds per foot or something like that? That's no joke. That's some serious load. On a bridge, take that number and triple it, if not quadruple it. So, because those uh, bridge elements are much larger. 
So, I mean, we're talking about a, a massive element. So, yeah, we have to account for self-weight, absolutely. Because, again, what load must all beams, no matter what, what load must all beams be able to withstand? Their own self-weight. They have to be able to, at the very least, hold themselves up. So, yeah, we have to account for that. <laughs> That, this, that's a good point. Anybody else? This is good stuff. Everybody good? <coughs> All right. So again, uh, I'm giving you the moment, so we don't need to go through and compute that. Uh, we only need to determine the area of steel, and then FC prime uh, and FY, we've got those. All right. Sound good? All right. So let's bring up the notebook. So this was our example last time. And remember, this was our final answer, that what's in the box. I mean, literally, you know, a 14-inch beam, 24 inches deep, uh, 21 inches effectively deep, and then we got three number 10. So let's see what we get uh, for this one. All right, let's see. Come on. All right. This is example seven, right? Okay, so let's write down a, a few values just right off the bat to, to get started. So let, let's, uh, let's start off with some, uh, some material values. Okay, so we have an FC prime, and that's what? 3 KSI. Now, pop quiz, if we have a 3 KSI uh, mix of concrete, what does that mean for beta 1? 0.85. Remember, it's 0.85 for any FC prime that's less than 4, and then we start trailing down after that, okay? So, so that means that beta 1 is going to be 0 0.85. Okay, now that's FC prime. We have an FY of 60 KSI. And what else? Let's, let's look at some beam geometry. All right, so B is 16 inches. We've got D of, well, what was D? 21. Keeping y'all on your toes. H is, what, 20, 24? Although we, we actually aren't going to need H. And ultimately what we're trying to find is the area of steel. Sound good? All right. So you help me out. You start walking through the procedure. You tell me what to do. So what would the first step for this problem be? Tell me. Find the nominal moment. We'll find the nominal moment because we've already got factored moment. So, so what, what I'm going to do is this. Yeah, exactly right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say you know, technically step one would be compute MU, all right? But we don't have to go through all that with this problem because MU uh, was given to us. So I'll say uh, since MU is given, we got an MU of 160 foot kip. That one's simple. If you remember, that, that was actually one of the steps on the last example that was one of the longest because we had to go through and get self-weight and factor it and WL squared over 8. So that, that took a little bit of time. Now, now Mr. Mitchell, what you, Mr. Mitchell, what'd you say uh, step two was? There we go. Compute MN. Now, now to compute MN, what's the issue? What do we got to do? There you go. There you go. Bless you. So we have to, and, and again, this is sort of where I get, oh, we got to make an assumption. Assume a fee of 0 0.9. All right. <coughs> Bless you. All right. So MN required is going to be MU over fee which is, what, 160 foot kips 
divided by 0 0.9, which is what? You tell me. There we go. 177.78 foot tips. Now, we are ultimately going to take this moment. This is just like what we did last time. We're going to take this moment, and it's going to be computed with a lot of beam dimensions and FC primes and whatnot. So what should I do to this? Take it and do what? Multiply by 12. Two kit, each kit. So what is that? 2133.33. Got a second on that? There we go. Well, like here. All right. Sound good? Okay. <coughs> so, so this next part, this is honestly one of, if not the longest calculations uh, for the whole example. The formula is a little long, but uh, uh, we can we can knock it out. All right. So what we've got to do is compute the required row value. Now again, we're not using 0.18 FC prime over FY. I know I've been saying that a lot, but I'm really trying to emphasize that because I want you to know the difference between using row uh, for a known cross-section, you know, where we can just derive it, versus row for an unknown cross-section where we got to just guess a value. We can be a little more scientific uh, with this one. So, row required, it's a big one, so let's see, so it's what, 0 0.85 FC prime divided by FY times 1 minus, and then we got a big square root in here, 1 minus, there, there are two 1 minuses there, that's not a typo, okay? So the fraction in here, 0 0.85 FC prime B D squared. And then on top we put 2 MN or MN required. Everybody read that? Y'all read that? All right. So let's just take this and one by one start plugging and chugging and then we'll work through this together see what we get. So 0 0.85, you all help me out. 0 0.85 times, what's FC prime? 3 KSI divided by FY, 60 KSI. Now we we'll use brackets for this, 1 minus. Remember, the nice thing about that Casio is you can use the, the display function on it to make this calculation look exactly like it does on the screen. So, <laughs> is he not a fan of the Casio? Or? Oh, okay. Well, I'm teaching 111 right now, so I'm, I'm using the Casio. So, <laughs> all right. Here on the bottom, we got 1 minus 0.85, and then FC prime is, help me out. There we go. All right. 3 KSI. All right. Uh, B, what was B? There we go. And D is 21. Now, hey, don't forget the 21, that's BD squared, so don't forget to square it. All right. And then 2 times what's MN required? There we go. 2133.33 inch kits. Now, while some of you all are working on this calculation, I want somebody else to help me with units. What's the answer going to be? What are the units for the answer? Think, think about what we're computing. What are we computing? There you go. It won't have any. First off, we got KSI over KSI. It cancels. Then over here, we have inch kips up top, and then on the bottom, KSI times inches cubed, that's inch kips on the bottom. So everything cancels. And that makes sense. It's a reinforcement ratio. It's just a percentage. You know, how much steel you got versus how much concrete you have. So it should be unitless. All right. Now, now when you compute this, you're going to get a small number. That's okay. All right. What somebody have a value? Okay, so if I if I write like zero point 
0.20538. Okay, if I got a second on that, second, there we go. All right, everybody got this? So that is our reinforcement ratio. That tells us how much steel we should have versus how much concrete we have. So I can take this, multiply it by the effective area of the beam, the B times D, and that'll give us a target for selecting steel. All right, so everybody got this? Okay, all right. Let's see, do I, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just move on to the next panel. Everybody got this? Okay. All right, so. All right, so let's see. So we're on step four. What's that? No, 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 no. That, no, that, okay, no, that's a good question. That's for an unknown cross section, yeah. For a known cross section, our step four is just compute the required area. So, no, yeah, I could totally see where, where that would happen. That's totally fine, so. required AS. So AS required, yeah, because you're on the other one, yeah. Row required BD. So yeah, so now we've got row, all we got to do is just row BD and there you go. Sound good? All right, so help me out, what was row again? There, there we go. I'm going to keep you all on your toes. And B and D, what are those? There we go. 16 inches, 21 inches. So what we got? 1.81. Sound good? All right. Everybody good so far? Right. Any questions? Okay, so step five, now we got to start looking at a family of rebar. So I'll say choose reinforcement. All right, choose reinforcement. So let's sort of knock that out. So let's see. Remember, we drew that little table and we said, all right, we've got bar size. We've got number of bars, and then we got, what was the third one, Let's see if y'all remember? Well, we have to have our required width, right? Oh, width. Okay, so. Let's break out that beam design aid, the one with the two tables on the top and bottom, and let's just sort of take it one step at a time, all right? So what's our first bar size that's on the chart? Number fours, okay? So let's start off with number fours, all right? Number fours. All right, say, all right so how many number fours do we need to make, what was it? Ten. Ten, okay, so we, if we were to go with ten number fours, you selected that Y. It has an area of steel of what? 1.96, you said? Okay, now, let us say that we went with 10 number fours. In order to fit 10 number fours in that beam, how wide would the beam need to be? 15 plus 3. 15 plus 3, you said? 15, there you go, exactly. So. That, that beam uh, guide on the bottom, it only goes to eight bars. And then it tells you if you've got additional bars to add an additional one and a half inches, right? So what do we got? So I'm, I'm actually going to write that out. So it's 15.8 inches plus 2 times 1.5, 18.8. Now, help me out. Is that a valid design selection? Nope because the beam's only 16 inches wide, so that's no good. All right, next one, number fives. So, well, somebody, somebody else, somebody else, tell me. Well, well hold on, hold on. Oops. 
What? Well, I'm, are you talking? I, I, are you talking about on the bottom or? Oh, okay. I, I see what you're saying. Well, that's that's what we're using the guide off of. If you want, I guess you could sort of. I guess you could add some additional space if you want. What I'll be honest, what I'm more interested in with that design is ensuring that we've got the D of 21 from the bottom. So, does that kind of help answer your question? So, I get what you're saying, how that's a little, little confusing. For a second, I, I didn't know what you were talking about. So, but yeah, I, I'm really not too, too terribly concerned with that, that side space. As long as we got the one and a half, we're good. That three inches is, is a, uh, it's a really sort of common starting value to assume you've got your inch and a half and then your stirrups on each end and what have you. So, so yeah, so that's fine. That, that's a good point, though, to make. Everybody else okay with that? Again, I'm more interested in just uh, uh, the, the cover on the bottom. I want to ensure I'm keeping that, that three inches on the bottom. All right. Everybody good? Okay. Now, uh, bar size. I, now num we're on number five. Somebody said uh, in here, how many number fives would we need? Six. Six. Okay. So everybody said it. All right. Now, why'd you pick that? Okay, and what, what was it? We're gonna, we are going to need the area. There we go, 1.84. All right. Now, in order to use this option, what would, what would we need for our beam width? 13.4. There we go. Now, let me ask you this. Is this a valid option? Yeah. No, but hey, he, you have it best, because what did you say? It could be. So maybe we ought to at least go on a little bit further. Okay, let's do one more. Let's just do one more, and then we'll, we'll sort of look in the, in the crystal ball a little bit and see if uh, future uh, selections would be more economical. How many number sixes would we need? Five. And you pick that because it's an area of steel of what? To use this, we would need a minimum beam width of 12.3. Okay. So this is a valid option as well. Sound good? All right. Now, first off, let, let's, let's sort of go down the line. We don't need to write anything down for this. Let me ask you this. Uh, what would the area of steel be if we went with number sevens? 2.41. What about number eights? 2.35. About, was it number nines? Two. Two. Are we getting any better? Do we have any better options? Not really. I mean, we're. I mean, this one's this one's pretty good, isn't it? That one or that number five. So, I don't know about you, but I say, let's just let's just go with this one. That's that's pretty good, right? I mean, we needed 1.81 square inches, and we got 1.84. Uh, that's pretty economical, right? I, I say go with it. Now, let's be clear, okay? Let's be clear. I'm going to draw out my cross section. So, here's my design. I've got a beam that looks something about like this. It is 16 inches. This uh, depth to the rebar. 21 inches, and our reinforcement is uh, I'll just one, two, three, four, five, six. I, I tell you one thing. I, this just helps me out. Sometimes it's a little confusing when, if I write six number fives, which is the count of the bars and which represents the number of the bars. So if you want, you can actually do this. You could say six number five bars. And actually write it out. I think it's a little easier to understand. You know, not if it's five number fives, uh, it doesn't really matter. Now the area, 1.84. Sound good? Right. Yes, sir.
Yes. Okay, so let me elaborate on that a little bit. So first off, yeah, if you use a heavier steel, you're going to add a little bit of weight. But let's, let's remember, we are not using a unit weight of 145 pounds per cubic foot. We're using 150. So remember, when we use a unit weight of 150 pounds per cubic foot, that's not a unit weight of concrete. That's a unit weight of reinforced concrete. Now, if you want, you could use 145 and literally start counting up the bars and say each bar weighs 490 pounds per cubic foot. You aren't going to find much of a difference. So, again, close enough for, for government work. Um, let me also say this. I throw more steel into the beam. Yeah, the beam gets stronger nominally. Okay, remember, we have to go back and check our fee value. I mean, if I took, let's say this is my design. And let's say there's no number five bar available at my local rebar supplier. So I say, well, the only thing they have is number eights or, or something, and i got to take this and double it to make it work. Well, yeah, I did, maybe I substantially increased my nominal capacity, but what if my fee value drops to, uh, what, you know, 0.8 or something, and it ultimately fails, you know? So if you're going to do that, that, that's totally fine. You know, if, if you've got, got to do it, you know, what you can with what you've got, but make sure you're still doing your math. Yes, sir? Well, no, well, no, no it, it's, it's raised up. Remember, this is three inches. Yeah, yeah, you could. And, and, and let's say this is the more economical option. You could do five and five. Okay. There, no, there, there's nothing against that at all. You're more than welcome to. The, the only thing is, when you compute your D distance, go to the center of the rebar pattern. That's totally fine. Yes, sir. Well, you're going to have to knock them up a little bit. So your, your D is probably going to shrink a little bit. Instead of 21 inches, because you're not going to have that cover on the bottom, you're exactly right. D is probably going to be 20 or, or 19 or something. No, 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 because now you've got a beam. Like, you, we, we were calculating row to design the beam. Now we have one, you know. Now we've got a beam. When we're in this mode, this is the time when it's like, okay, let's write an Excel spreadsheet and let's start playing around with the values to, to get the most economical design. But you don't need to start uh, recal like starting from scratch because the whole point of going from scratch at the very beginning was to get a beam. Now we've got one so we can start working with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, but that, I would do that at the very end when I know that my VMN works. So. That's, yes, that is for single layers. So if, yeah, if, if okay, so if you had, like, let's say we went with the number fours and there was a layer of five and then a layer of five. You would go off of the minimum beam width requirement for five number fours, which is what? 11.3 said? Okay, so for if I was going to take this design up top and do five number fours, five number fours, that'd be fine. That'd be totally fine, okay? But like we were saying earlier, by raising this, uh, by do, using two layers in this preformed uh, beam, D is probably going to drop down a little bit. It's probably going to be like 20 inches or 19 and a half or something like that. You want D to be as large as possible because D means moment arm and moment arm means larger capacity. Right. Everybody okay with this? This is good stuff. Okay. Any questions? All right. <clears throat> so here's what we've got. This, let's be clear. This is a trial design. Because of everything that we're talking about in here, we're not done. There's stuff that needs to be checked, okay? There's stuff that needs to be checked. So I'm going to list some remaining steps. 
Okay. So help me out. What's a couple things that we need to uh, check on this? Help me out. I can think of three right off the bat. One of them has to do with the guess that we made right at the beginning. We have to go and calculate our fee value, right? So that means calculate the strain in the steel, go and calculate MN, go and do all that. So number one, we have to verify that fee is in fact 0 0.9, right? That's a good one. Now, what are the two API checks that we had to do on top of fee MN has to be greater than or equal to MU? One of them you mentioned, the area of steel. We have to verify that AS is greater than the minimum amount we have to provide. Now, more often than not, that's never going to be a problem, but we got to go through. We got to go through and do it. Okay. What's the third one? There's a, there's one more. It's a strain. Say, say it again. Well, okay. I'm, I'm going to go into that here in a second. I'm, zero zero four. Remember this. If it's point, if it's greater than point zero zero five, then that is verifying that fee is 0.9, but we could have a strain that is, you know, 0 0.0046, then it meets the ACI limit, but that isn't 0.9. Does that make sense? So we have to verify that the strain in the steel is greater than 0 0.004. You're right, essentially. We're sort of roundabout doing it when we go through and compute fee. Can't forget to just make sure that we've assessed that. Because it's possible that it didn't work, you know. It's very possible. Right? Well, that, that's a good question. All right, that would go into step one when we did MU. But... I just gave it to you. So for this, we really don't need it. Well, okay, in a typical beam design, so the architect comes in and they say, all right, I need a column there, I need a column there, I need a column there. You know, I, I can't have columns anywhere else because I'm the architect and I want windows and I want everybody to be able to see the sign building across on 3rd Avenue. So um, I need nice open window space. So between the architect and you, the structural engineer working together, you're going to be able to lay out the base space. If I know how far apart these columns are, where the beams are going. Like there's a column there, and there's a column right there behind you. So behind Mr. Scarberry and behind uh, Mr. Foreman, there are columns. There's a beam in between them. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that beam has a tributary area. It has a set of moments on it, or a set of forces on it, W, you know, WL squared over 8, or if it's part of a moment frame or something like that, got to go through and, you know, do out all the analysis. Any questions? Now, does anybody have any questions about, like, these remaining steps? One point I'll, I'll, I'll mention, um, uh, Mr. Lewis said efficiency, okay? What you'll probably find for this design is that it is incredibly efficient because we derived how much steel we needed. Bless you. We derived how much steel we needed. And then look at this, 1.81 versus 1.84. I mean, we were, we're damn close on that, on that rebar selection. You're probably going to get like a 98%, 97%, maybe even 99%. I mean, it's going to be close, and that's good. We want it to be as close to 100% Without going over, right? Remember, it's like the price is right, you know? As close as possible without going over. I, I'm still happy that folks get the price is right reference. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. Yeah, I'll, it's Drew Carey, right? <laughs> you've, got, you've, got the, you've got the strategy figured out. <laughs> All right. 
Does anybody have any questions about the process? I'm actually good. This is what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to let you all do this, the remaining steps, because it's the same thing we did on the last example, and honestly, you're going to get some practice on the next homework anyway. So I'm going to let you all work on that. Oh, no. Homework. The H word. All right. No, not yet. We've got a couple things we've got to talk about. All right. Anybody got any questions? Yes, sir. No, 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 no. All right, all right, shh. What do you mean? That's a good question. So um, depending upon the length of the bridge, I'd say that there's no real connections like, like you're talking about. I mean, it's not like a, a building where, you know, you have to connect this beam to this column. If you've got a large reinforced concrete bridge, literally the beam sits on the abutments and, and that's it. You know, there, there, are, there is no connection. Um, now, one thing I will say, uh, and I'm going to go back into the slideshow a little bit uh, to bring up a building example. So let's go back in time, way back in time. So right here, okay? So remember this? This is that picture I took of the parking garage over on 3rd Avenue? Okay, so essentially what's going on is there's not really a connection right here. It's really just sitting on, the, the, um, on this transfer girder right here. So if I were to investigate sort of this detail right here, the, um, the T-beams framing in, they kind of look like this. So you've got, you know, here's the T-beams right here. So that's, you know, that element right there. And then this part right there is just sort of going like that. Now, now, let me be clear, the reinforcement right around here, I mean, you've got to design a special set of reinforcement to handle that shear right there. But, but that's basically it. If you also, if you look in the center part of the parking garage on 3rd Avenue, what you're going to find is this. So look at the columns, okay, and you'll see the columns sort of sticking up and down like that, but you'll see these little notches sort of sticking out. They kind of look like that. Have you all seen that? They have, have these little notches sticking out, and then there'll be, you know, beams sitting on it like this. Those little notches are what's called a corbel, a C-O-R-B-E-L. You, well, you got to detail the reinforcement around that very carefully, but it sort of just acts as a beam seat, and it just sits down, and there you go. I mean, notice how there's no, like, braces or anything in between because concrete beams are so heavy that bracing and buckling for beams most time isn't a problem. You know, they're so massive that they're not going to buckle. That ain't the case with steel. Steel beams, they want to buckle, and the math gets a little more complicated. That's why in steel we put beams off to the very end, uh, but from here we can handle it right now. So, this is good stuff. Any other questions? All right. I do want to at least give you a little bit of a, a taste of things to come for, for what we talk about next. You know, we've spent all this time talking about beams, um, well, it's probably a good idea to talk about slabs. So we're going to get into this a little bit next time, but I at least want to give you a little bit of a taste of things to come. So first off, has anybody got any questions anymore about example seven? This is good stuff. You know, we got plenty of time. So, Yes, sir. You mean in that in that reinforce in that corbel? On that little center step. Concrete steel is compression so it's loose. You can't just have concrete there. No, no, you're there's loops going in this way, there's loops going that way. I mean it, it's a little intricate, I'm I'm not gonna lie. It, it detailing a corbel, we've got some other stuff to talk about. I mean we haven't one of the things we haven't even talked about is just how concrete behaves in shear in general. You know, I mean, we gotta talk about that too. So we can have that discussion like later when we even talk about shear because um, it's a little involved. Um, you can do it. I mean, it's just it's a little involved. But yeah, there's a lot of reinforcement in there. Anybody else? All right. I at least want to talk a little bit about slab design because here's a building. You know, there's a floor system in a building, right? And and uh, it is comprised of not just beams. 
framing in all over the place but slabs. Especially in concrete buildings, a lot of times the slabs and the beams are cast integrally. So up until now, we've just been talking about beams as if they're sort of their own unique element in the building. You know, here's a rectangular beam, and then there's a slab on top of it. Well, we can design beams. We're going to talk here in a little bit about how to design slabs. The next thing we'll talk about after that is T-beams, how to design a beam if you're counting on a little bit of that slab. And you can get some really efficient and economical designs by saying it's not just a rectangular beam. It's a rectangular beam and a little bit of that slab. But we got to, you know, walk before we can run, so we've got the beams down pat, so we'll talk a little bit about the slabs. Now, you, you see up here I've got one-way slabs. What do I mean by one-way slabs? Well, one-way slabs talks about the way uh, that we assume that slabs bend. So a one-way slab, we're, we're clever in our naming convention as engineers, one-way slabs we assume bend one way. You know, they either bend like this or like that. Two-way slabs, on the other hand, we assume that two-way slabs bend in both directions. Now, there are some advantages to using two-way slabs in buildings because you can develop floor systems that are very shallow, that are much shallower. And, and that's great for the architect because shallower floors can lead to more floors if you're doing something like a high-rise. Like, uh, uh, for instance, in, in Washington, D.C., there's a, a, a city ordinance that states that if you construct a multi-story uh, office complex, it can be tall, but it can't be taller than one particular thing in D.C. And what do you think that is? Washington Monument. You cannot construct a, a, a commercial high-rise office building in Washington, D.C. that can be taller than the Washington Monument. You, you violate city ordinance. So structural engineers and architects, they use flat slab construction in Washington, D.C. all the time. Because think about it like this. If you can take the structure of a floor system and turn it from 12 inches to say eight inches. Well, that doesn't mean a whole lot for one story, but take that, that space savings and add it up 30, 40 stories. What's going to happen? You're going to get another floor in that building. Another floor in that building for the folks that own that building is more space for them to rent out to law firms, and lobbyists, and, and accountants and whatnot. So that's more uh, rent in, in their pocket for that building. So yeah, it's flat slab construction, well, they use it all over the place. They even, they've used it at Marshall, too. If you go and look at the, uh, some of the floor systems in Drinko, they use a, a, what's called a waffle slab uh, technique. And they use waffle slabs because waffle slabs are, are stout. I mean, imagine it's a slab, but you've got beams going this way and this way. I mean, it looks like an Eggo waffle, just really blown up. But think about it. In a library, you've got to have a stout floor system, right? Remember, libraries, they experience like 150 pounds per square foot everywhere, you know. Classroom, we only got about, what, 40 pounds per square foot? Nothing compared to a library. So you need that, that uh, bump in capacity. These, the downside, they're tough to analyze and design. So we'll probably talk about this near the end of the semester. What I'm more focused on, on is your fundamental slab uh, design. But, but here's the thing. A slab is nothing more than a really wide beam, okay? That's it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick out like let's say a 12 inch strip of this slab and we're gonna say, all right, if you can design one slab strip and pick out the reinforcement in this strip, well heck, just use that reinforcement everywhere. And that's it, okay? So we'll have a pretty quick example on, on slab next time and it is a design with a known cross section because you know the width, and you can solve for the thickness, so it's, uh, it's pretty simple. All right, uh, that's all I got for you this time. Don't forget your homework. It's due on Friday. Sign-in sheet's working its way around. If you haven't already got that, make sure you sign in. And uh, we'll see you next time. All right, that's all I got.